So today we're going to talk about how to disseminate your meta research, why you need a communication strategy, and how to design one that works. And this is something that is quite unique to meta research and is not so or not as important potentially in other areas of science. Um, so I hope that you'll get some valuable information from this part of today's session. So this is my first meta research paper, which was published in 2015. And one of the things that happened when we published this paper was that it went viral online very quickly. So it was viewed more than 100,000 times in the first month of publication. And because it had so much response and there was so much discussion around it, it started contributing to um, changes in journal policies where journals were asking authors to replace bar graphs of continuous data with more informative graphics and then citing the paper as a resource or sending the paper out to authors when they were asking authors to make changes. So what I'm going to talk about for the next 20 or 30 minutes is how we wrote this paper, um, what our strategy was behind the scenes, what we did to put together a communication strategy for this paper, and some things that we've learned from publishing subsequent papers since then and developing communication strategies for those. So I want to start by talking about what is a communication strategy. And a communication strategy is simply a plan for how you will present your work so that it resonates with your target audience. So you have here, you know, as shown in this image, you have two sides of a bridge and a gap. And when you're starting a meta research project, you want to imagine that your meta research team is on one side of that gap and your target audience is on the other side. And in between you, there is a gap in knowledge, in vocabulary, and in experience. Sometimes you may not agree about whether this thing that you're studying is actually a problem um, or, or a benefit to the scientific community, depending on what you're doing. Sometimes the gap may be smaller. You may agree that there's a problem, but you may not know how to solve it or why the problem exists or how common the problem is. And you may also be using different terms or different language to refer to that problem. And so your communication strategy is just a set of tools that's going to help you to share your research in a way that other people will read it and want to respond. Why does that matter? Why do we need a communication strategy? Well, when we're doing meta science, the goal is not to publish papers. The fact that you've published something and listed it on your CV now isn't really important. It's not the end goal. What we want to achieve with meta research is to improve research practice. So what matters is that your audience heard you and that they're motivated to act, to start exploring solutions, to start making changes, perhaps in their own research group or in their own research projects, perhaps on a more systemic level. I'm going to share some just initial observations about things that drive sharing, and these are just some lessons learned from non-scientific tests using my own social media account. And so the first thing is that if you are sharing something that's easier to understand, that requires less expertise and training, you get more sharing. So when I, a lot of my early work was focusing on visualization and statistics, and visualization is more accessible to people. So those, those pieces were more widely shared. Um, figures illustrating a problem are more effective and more widely shared than figures showing solutions. It's not that solutions aren't important or that solution-based figures aren't helpful. It's that people realizing there's a problem is, is essential, and if they don't realize that there is a problem, then they're not interested in a figure that shows a solution to the problem because they didn't know it existed. So figures illustrating a problem tend to do better than figures that show solutions. When I share materials that have free resources for implementing solutions, people like that more than when there are no resources for implementing solutions and you're just kind of saying, this is a problem, figure it out yourself. So free resources, very helpful and very effective for promoting sharing. Um, the last there, the fourth thing is something that you cannot necessarily control. And this is having a core group of, of researchers who are passionate about the issue. 
So in the case of our bar graphs paper, we really benefited from the fact that there had been a core group of people who had been advocating for the change that we were discussing in our paper for decades. And they were very passionate about the topic. So when our paper came out, they took it and they shared it with everyone they knew because they had a tool now that was very effective in talking to people that had a message that resonated with people and helped them understand why it was important for their own research. And that was what led to the earlier the early dissemination. Sometimes you're working in areas where you have that core group of scientists who are really passionate about the issue, other times you don't. Um, when you do have that, it can be helpful to know who those people are and to connect to them or to involve them in your work so that they can help you with improving the quality of the work and with the dissemination of that work. And then Comprehensive threads or tutorials can be more beneficial than single posts, um, giving people a very fast overview of the work that you've done and the lessons learned is very helpful. Not everyone has time to go back and read every single paper that they see shared. Okay, so there are a number of steps to developing your communication strategy, and I'll talk about each of these in more detail. But the first one is to know your audience, everything you can possibly know about your audience you need to know. The second is to identify the most challenging concepts for your audience and create visualizations. The third is to offer solutions that are feasible. The fourth is to select, select the most, best format for sharing. And we'll talk more about how to do that for a paper and then other ways. And then you want to finally write your paper using your visuals as a roadmap. The most important thing to remember about a communication strategy is that you ideally want to start developing your communication strategy on the first day of your project. A good communication strategy takes time to develop, and it requires having conversations with members of your target audience to find out how they feel about the issue. The sooner you start that process, the easier it will be to put together a strong communication strategy that really addresses the needs of, your, of the audience that you want to reach with your work. Okay, so step one is to know your audience. First thing I want you to remember is that your audience is probably broader than you think, and I'll give you some examples. So you expect that your audience is going to include scientists, um, often scientists in your field. For meta research, also related fields and also unrelated fields that use similar practices. So you can have a wide range of fields that are interested in the same meta research project because they're all using very similar practices. You might have clinicians or clinician scientists, perhaps even patients who are interested in your project, depending on what you're doing. Our team works a lot on publications and preprints and improving the quality and transparency of papers. So journal editors and publishers are a big audience for us. Depending on what you're studying, funding or regulatory agencies could be an audience. And we also sometimes get communications about our work from people in related professions, for example, high school teachers who are interested in using some of the materials that we've created. It is very likely that you have more than one audience, and it's also likely that different audiences might be interested in your work for different reasons. So a lot of our early papers on visualization and statistics were written for two audiences. The first one was researchers who were using the practices that we were discussing, and we wanted them to learn more about why those practices were potentially problematic and how they could replace them with better alternative practices. The second audience was statisticians, and we knew statisticians were reading the papers to understand what the basic scientists were doing and how they were thinking about these issues and how to talk to basic scientists about the practices that we were interested in to encourage them to do something else. Okay, so I'll give you an example of the type of information that we have about our audience. So our description of our audience is 
far more than a page, uh, single spaced bullet points in 11 point font right now, and we update it each time we finish a study. So we have details about the amount and type of training that they're likely to have related to the topics that we study what software programs they prefer to use for visualization and statistics. We know what common study designs, sample sizes, and analyses they are performing. We have data on errors that are accepted as standard practices um, in the fields where we work regularly. We have information on misconceptions about data visualization or statistics that are quite common. And then we also have information of, about constraints. So what types of solutions are possible? What types of solutions are unlikely to work for our target audience? So this is a lot of detail. It's much more than simply knowing I want to reach basic scientists in toxicology or similar. There are three strategies that you can use to get to know your audience. The first is to have members of your audience on your research team. So for our early papers, I was the representative of our audience. I was trained as a physiologist. And then I had two colleagues that I worked closely with who were statisticians, and we had other people who helped us with various projects as needed. The second strategy that you can use is to do meta research, and that will help you collect clear data on the problem and the context in which it occurs, practices around or related to that problem that influence what solutions you might suggest or how, what language you might use to talk about the problem. And then conversations with your target audience, as many conversations as possible to get a sense of how they think about the issue. So um, what should you be asking about in conversations with your audience? You might talk to them about the design of your meta research study, a high level overview of your methods or the results that you've obtained so far. You might want to know how they think about the issue you're studying. Do they feel that it's a problem or a beneficial practice? How has it impacted their work on a daily basis? You might wonder what aspects of the issue are most relevant to their daily practice or most interesting to them and what are least relevant. You might wonder about their concerns, about the problem, about proposed solutions, misconceptions that they have, or knowledge gaps. Where is how they think about this issue different from how you think about this issue? And how would the changes that you're proposing benefit them? This is always really important to emphasize if we're encouraging people to change their approach. Barriers to change is also critical. What stops them from implementing different practices or changing what they're doing? What would the barriers be and how can you address those barriers? You don't want to start outlining your paper or any other materials that you plan to disseminate until all authors understand the document describing your target audience. So you all need to know who it is that you are writing for or creating content for. So I mentioned that your writing team should ideally include a member of your target audience. Let's talk about why this is important. And this is important because that person can help you to determine whether the paper will resonate with other members of your target audience. So they'll help you answer questions like, is this paper focusing on the aspects of the issue that are important to members of the audience? Is the vocabulary appropriate? Is it something that they would understand? Are you using the terms that they would use or introducing new terms if you have to use those? Are the examples that you're providing making sense? Do they resonate? Are the visualizations that you're using effective to convey your main points? Perhaps you missed something when you were collecting or interpreting your data that is essential to the, the question that you want to address. And then lastly, solutions. Are they feasible? Are they relevant? Would they actually work? Um, what are the barriers to implementation going to be? What other stakeholders need to be involved to help get those solutions implemented on a large scale? So, for a guiding question, I would just encourage you as you're thinking about a communication plan for your project to think about what you're doing to get your, to know your audience and what other techniques you might try. Okay, the second step is to identify the most challenging concepts for your audience and then create visualizations. 
So here's an example from that first paper that we published in 2016. And the goal was to address the misconception that summary statistics are all that matters. And I won't go into detail about this visualization or what it shows, but essentially it was developed in order to address the misconception that the summary statistics are the only thing that is important and to illustrate what kind of information we're missing when we only see summary statistics and we don't see the underlying data. This is a second example from one of our later papers. Um, and this is simply a visualization that's designed to address the misconception that you can still use a bar graph to show continuous data as long as those data are normally distributed. So when you create visualizations, you want to start with a clear message. You want to target misconceptions directly, and you want to go through many versions of your figures. The first version is never going to be good. Um, and so you want to test and revise until your figure is working. And I just like to include this quote from Helene Ambor, who is at the Technical University in Dresden that good visualizations are designed, they don't happen by accident. So when my colleagues ask me to consult on a visualization, I will often ask them, what is this designed to show? And sometimes they will tell me, I don't know. And I will say, okay, I can tell because I don't know what it's designed to show either. So let's talk about how we can fix that. So I'm gonna give you an example by showing the various different versions that I went through in order to design this figure. And so, um, the first thing I needed to do was develop a concept for the figure. And so my concept, I wanted to show that bar graphs don't allow us to critically evaluate continuous data, that they distort our perception of the range of observed values, and that they draw our attention to unimportant aspects of the data. Specifically, they, force it there, they draw our attention to the height of the bar as opposed to the overlap between groups and how the difference in the means compares to the variability in the data. This is already quite a bit of message to include in a single figure. Figures with one messages are much easier to design. And therefore, I knew that I was going to have to go through a lot of versions to get something that was going to be working because this is a difficult thing. So the first thing I did was draw a sketch of what I thought my visualization might look like. And so I knew that I wanted to have a bar graph showing mean and standard error a bar graph with a dot plot, and then a dot plot with a loan, a loan. And I knew that I was going to have a, a part at the bottom of the scale where there would be no data points. And then I was going to have a part at the top of the y-axis scale where there would be data points, but that part would be cut off in the mean and standard error bar graph because the bars or the, the scale usually ends a little bit above the error bar for the largest group. So this is my overall concept. So my next step was to actually create the graphs in the figure and fill in the details. And so this was my first version. So I filled in the three graphs. I have the colors and the labeling as I did in the original version. And as you can see, this figure is a mess. Um, there's a lot going on here. There are too many irrelevant details. And as a result, we can't tell what's important. So how do we fix this? Well, the first thing we need to do is eliminate everything that's irrelevant. So this is an infographic, it's not a data figure. If it were a data figure, I would never eliminate the y-axis labels. But for this infographic, it does not matter what variable I'm measuring or what the scale of that variable is. What will be important to making my point is that the y-axis of the bar graph starts at zero. So that's the only thing I need to keep but everything else on the y-axis labels can be deleted because it's not relevant for the content of this particular infographic. So I did that. The next problem that I see is that the use of color is uninformative. So color is what's called a pre-attentive attribute, which means our eyes pay attention to color, whether we want them to or not. And in this case, the color is creating a flag effect. It's drawing the eye away from where I want the reviewer to focus instead of towards where I want the, review, the reader to focus. And so what I need to do to improve this version is to use color to highlight where our attention should be when examining this data. And our attention should be on the range of observed values. 
So I made this change. I got rid of the extra colors. So now we only have one color highlighting the range of observed values. And we have a label to show what it is that that color is highlighting. So the next problem is that I'm missing information that's critical to the message of the figure. So part of the message of the figure is that the bar graph distorts our perception of the range of observed values because there can be data points at the high end of the graph that are not shown in the axis or that the y-axis doesn't include. And depending on the data set, there may also be um, a, a region around above zero where there are no data points and it's not biologically or physiologically possible that data points would ever be there. So this part is completely missing now, so I need to add boxes to the bar graph to highlight regions of distortion. So I do this. So now I have random boxes with no explanation for what they represent. So I need names for these areas of distortion. And so I chose to call them the zone of invisibility and the zone of irrelevance to explain how those are just how those two zones are distorting our perception of the range of observed values when I use a bar graph to graph continuous data. And this is what I would do for a figure in a paper. If I were sharing this in a talk or on social media, I might add some additional text to explain what this figure is about and further highlight main message. So my title might be why you shouldn't use a bar graph to even if your data are normally distributed. And then I explain below that bar graphs don't allow you to critically evaluate continuous data because we can't see the data points, and that they arbitrarily assign importance to the bar height rather than focusing our attention on the overlap between groups and how the difference in means compares to the variability in the data. So this is an example of the process you might go through when you're designing your figures. You want to test your visualizations. I usually do tests of 10 to 30 seconds long, depending on how complex the visualization is. If someone can't very quickly get the message of your figure, then keep designing until you get something that's fast and efficient in conveying your message. I will often use social media where I might send out different versions of a, of a figure, or I'll just send out one version and see how people respond to it. You can also ask a co-author to check your calculations, your summary statistics, or recreate data figures using a different software to make sure that there are no mistakes. And you might also consider depositing your visualizations in an online repository. We get a lot of requests to reuse our figures, and so having them in a repository makes my life easier because they're under an open license. Anyone can get them. They don't have to email me and ask me for the data. Okay, social media tests, lessons learned, always include your name and your social media handle on your figure. Um, I have had lots of cases where something that I shared on social media was then shared with others off social media. And so just knowing where it came from is very helpful for people. Be aware that others might save your visualization or ask where they can find the original. Um, so I've certainly had people email me and say, hey, I've checked all your papers. I can't find this figure. I really want to use it. Where, you know, where can I get it? Um, I send things as a normal post without stating it's a test just to see how people react. And I typically send competing visualizations in separate posts to see which gets more response and what type of response they generate. And then I may revise or add figures based on comments and questions that I get from people. Some cautions, social media, it can be very valuable in assessing how your target audience will respond and getting you access to people that you wouldn't normally be in contact with. However, you need to remember that scientists who use social media aren't representative of all scientists um, and that not everyone who sees your figure will be part of your target audience. So be strategic about whether and how you respond to comments from people who are clearly far outside your target audience and coming from a very different perspective. And then I use social media when I need something, I don't obsess over it or use it routinely. Okay, so when you're thinking about strategy two or step two for developing your communication strategy, you want to ask yourselves what concepts are most challenging for members of your audience and how might you present them visually. Step three is to offer feasible solutions. So we talked before about getting to know your target audience and about identifying barriers to implementing the practice that you want to implement. 
So you might think about how you can create tools that your audience will need to implement solutions if there aren't tools readily available. For our various papers, we have introduced templates, um, shiny apps and simulators, tables and checklists. We have offered slide sets, and now we more commonly use instructional videos, which make it easier for people to view content on YouTube. We might offer protocols for how to do something, um, code or a visual flipbook of how to make different visualizations in our case, or other types of training materials that may be useful depending on the issue that you're looking at in your target audience. You want to focus on what your audience needs and what they will actually use. And if you are creating software tools, then it's helpful to get a research resource identifier for those. Research resource identifiers or RIDs are unique persistent identifiers that show others exactly what you used. Um, you can get one online on the RID portal included in your publication and ask others to cite it if they're using your software tool, and this makes it easier to track how many others are using your tool or resource and how they're using it. Okay, as you're thinking about solutions and offering solutions, you always want to consider whether your comments would still apply to investigators who have different experimental designs, different outcome variables, are working in a different field, and so on and so forth. And then consider whether you have addressed solutions for the different stakeholder groups that might be needed to solve this problem. That might include scientists or researchers, journal editors and publishers, funding bodies, regulatory agencies, or other relevant stakeholder groups, depending on the issue that you examine. So as you're thinking about strategy three, consider what solutions you're developing and how you can test whether those solutions work for your audience. Step four is selecting the best format for disseminating your materials. And I'll focus mostly on um, writing meta research papers in this section, although there are certainly other options, especially for solutions. So we have published some things as original research articles and other things as perspectives where we put the data in a text box or in the supplement. We originally did our first paper, the 2015 paper as a perspectives because that was the only way that the journal would consider it because they considered it to be out of scope at the time. Um, now that same journal does have a meta research collection so we can submit original research articles to them. However, perspectives are often shorter, they're easier to read, they convey the main messages quickly, and they may be more accessible or user-friendly to so scientists who don't read meta-research per se, but just want to know about the implications of work for what they're doing in their own research. You want to think carefully about formats for individual sections. Um, text boxes are underused in scientific research. They can be extremely valuable. A lot of papers we include text boxes in. If you have content that some people will need and others won't, that's of interest to some readers but not to others, or that doesn't really fit in line with the main flow of the manuscript, it can be very helpful to present that information in text boxes. Um, we've also done simulators with interactive visualizations to illustrate points, and then we've used various other techniques as well in terms of figures, tables, um, combinations of figures and tables, and slide sets, so on and so forth. You want to be prepared to justify your choices and negotiate with editors. We pretty regularly have conversations about needing more figures, especially if we're doing a paper on visualizations. We've had journals that um, don't include a text box format, and so we've had to ask them to create one for us so that we can offer a text box as part of our paper. So always justify why you need that particular format or thing and discuss with the editor um, if, if it's against journal policy or rules to see if there is flexibility. Your goal is to write the best paper that you can. The editor should also ultimately want you to write the best paper that you can so that it will be widely disseminated, which helps their journal and their publisher. 
Step five is to ripe your paper using your visuals and solutions as a roadmap. So we always do our visuals and our text boxes first, um, as well as our tables, and then we write the paper afterwards. And this makes life much easier because you can simply use the words and the text as a way of connecting the different visuals that you have for explaining these complicated concepts. So in terms of testing, you want to ask members of your target audience to provide feedback on your visualizations, on tools or solutions that you're offering, and on the paper. What works? What was unclear? What did they think the main message was? If they came away with a different main message from what you intended, then you want to adjust things so that the main message is what you intended it to be. Would they think about doing things differently on their next project or paper? Why or why not? That can be really important information for knowing whether your paper is having an impact. Um, would they feel comfortable talking to their colleagues about this issue? Why or why not? Maybe there's a part that they didn't understand. There wasn't enough information. They're not sure that they fully understand everything that they would need to engage in a conversation with a colleague. Filling those gaps as you write your paper is really important. And then barriers to implementation. What's going to make the solution not work and how can you address those things? In terms of manuscript submission, use your cover letter strategically. So a lot of journals don't necessarily have experience in reviewing meta research and they may not have meta research editors who are available or reviewers who are available to assess your paper, particularly if you are submitting to a field specific or specialist journal. You want to clearly define your audience and emphasize the relevance of your work to many fields. I usually request two types of reviewers. One is content area experts who can evaluate the quality of the meta research that was done in the paper. And the second is members of the target audience because I want to know how it resonates with them. And so I will be very explicit about that in my cover letter. And if I'm suggesting reviewers, I will clearly define which reviewers belong to which category. Um, and then, as I mentioned, you may need to go negotiate with editors for extra figures, for text boxes, or other features that the journal hasn't encountered before or doesn't use regularly. Check your page proofs carefully, especially in papers with a lot of figures. The placement of figures and legends can be off. There can be features missing from the figures. There are all kinds of problems that it can occur. Um, I've also had figures that were mismatched to a, a, le a legend from a different figure in the paper. So make sure that everything is where you want it to be, that the figures are placed in a way that they're close to where they're referred to in the text, um, and that all your visual display items look like they should. Check the resolution and the size of your figures. If the resolution isn't high enough and you're not getting a clean image, then give the journal a higher resolution version to work with. And then if you have slide sets, um, consider de depositing them. And this can be very helpful if you have visualizations or other tools that are designed to provide a comprehensive overview of the issue. Um, in favor of slide sets, we're now using YouTube videos more and more so that people can see the actual talk delivered, the actual content that goes along with the talk. And the talk is usually just a, a, a short version of the paper of what someone would need to know for their own scientific practice and how to use this paper to make their research better. And then you can also create a corresponding social media thread in order to help disseminate the work and offer a, another fast format for consuming the content of the paper and understanding how it would change one's work and approach. <clears throat> and just as an illustration of this, um, I've mentioned that threads on social media can be a very effective dissemination tool. So here's an example of a thread that we use for our original bar graphs paper, as well as subsequent papers on that topic that we have done since. And so this is just entitled Designing Better Figures for Small Studies, Why You Shouldn't Use Bar Graphs for Continuous Data and What to Do Instead. And then it's a visual Q&A thread. So each tweet um, or post in this particular thread 
uh, asks a question and then it provides a visualization and potentially a link to answer that question. So the next question that we usually get is, can I still use a bar graph if my data are normally distributed? And we show the figure illustrating why not with a link to the paper containing that figure. We then get the question, what should I use instead of a bar graph? So we have a figure that answers this question. Um, do I need expensive software for all this? No, there are lots of free tools that make it easier to create more informative graphics. And then we have some resources to help users identify free tools. And some people will then say, I still prefer bar graphs because they convey a clear message. Sometimes it's hard to see what's going on with dot plots. And to solve this, we want to emphasize the data points and de-emphasize the dots to convey a clear message while allowing readers to critically evaluate the data. And we have a visual showing what that looks like. And the thread goes on from there. I think you get the idea. Um, so when you're doing social media posts that are threads or tutorials, this is essentially just a series of self-exclamatory text fragments or infographics um, that are augmented by links out to other resources. The content of our threads is always driven by conversations with our target audience, so we know what questions they're going to ask in the order that we're going to ask them, and we combine those things into a thread. And using a question and answer format can be very effective because you answer every question that they have in the order that they would have them, and it goes along with the way that they're already thinking about the issue. So we prepare the text for each post in a Word document, um, list the file name below the visual for each post, and then we add new questions and visuals as needed as we have more conversations with members of our target audience. And then we create one folder for each thread that includes the text as well as all the visuals. And sometimes in the past, I have shared a thread on the topic before major talks to allow people then to have an online resource or version of the talk that they can refer to. So conclusions, um, five steps. First, know your audience. Second, create a communication strategy. Use visualizations to illustrate and explain the most challenging concepts. Step three is to offer feasible solutions. Step four is to select the best format for communicating your method and be creative. And the last step is to test to make sure your communication strategy works.